Ja, äh, herzlich willkommen zu MMCD 2015. <lacht> Vielen Dank. Und ja, ich will gar nicht lange rumreden, danach macht der Unicorn nachher noch. Äh, ich möchte nur Herrn Dr. Paolo Ferri, Head of ESA Operations, ankündigen. Und ja, viel Spaß mit seinem Vortrag. Thank you, Schön. That's what I, I, I have to switch to English. Yeah? Yeah. Right. Okay. The, the presentation is also in English. Um, right. I'm going to tell you about Rosetta. It's a mission that maybe many of you have heard, maybe some not. Uh, it's all this that I'm telling about uh, is happening in ESOC, or is happening actually 100 or millions of kilometers away. But we control everything from ESOC, so it's around the corner. It's uh, a very exciting thing and this is all these stories are very unique in uh, in the world i mean nobody else in the world today has done what uh, our teams in isoc have done uh, in the past few years so it's really quite a unique story um, i personally have worked uh, 30 years in isoc actually 31 now and uh, almost 20 on rosetta so i was there from the beginning so i know a lot of uh, of stories. I could spend the whole afternoon and evening telling you this, but I have half an hour, 40 minutes, so we'll see. Um, now, Rosetta is a, is a comet mission. We wanted to study comets, and this is the main objective of the mission. And if you look at uh, comets, they've been always very, very interesting objects. They were uh, seen, I mean, they all look like this uh, when they are very bright and uh, you look at the night sky. They come, they stay a few weeks, a few months uh, in the sky. They move slowly compared to the fixed stars. So a big mystery throughout the history of mankind. And mankind saw comets like this until just a few hundred year, years ago. They interpreted them as bad signs or good signs. Uh, this is a tapestry that uh, that was made uh, at the time of the Battle of Hastings, uh, so about 1,000 years ago. And you see the Halley Comet depicted there. So I guess the ones who won the battle considered it a good sign, the ones who lost. <laughs> this is a matter of interpretation. But they, they actually uh, not only gave, uh, uh, say, a way to interpret, but also comets have affected our planet throughout the history. This is uh, an example. There are craters all around uh, the Earth, although the geology of Earth has uh, developed, so you don't see so many craters like on Mars or on the Moon. But uh, asteroids and comets can hit the Earth, have hit the Earth in the past, they will hit the Earth in the future. So it's, it's not only a scientific object uh, of scientific interest, but also say, for the future of mankind, it's good to, to learn about these things. Who knows what's going to happen in the future? Now, uh, the era of telescopes started in the 17th century. And uh, since then, this is what we see uh, when we look at the comet. Not very different from when you look at it at, uh, with naked eye. Uh, eventually, this is a, a, the, the tail, the coma is called. The tail of the comet is millions of kilometers long. Uh, and uh, the comet, the real object that creates this, is a small object here in the, the beginning, at the source. And nobody can see that from Earth. In fact, all you see is a tail of gas and, uh, and dust that reflects the light of the, of the sun. Um, it develops when the comet gets close to the sun, and then it goes away, blown away by the solar wind when the comet goes away from the sun and freezes again. So that's all you can see from Earth. Then the era of spacecraft came. And this was also spacecraft control from ESOC in the mid 80s. And it did the first flu flyby together with other spacecraft of a comet nucleus. So this is the first time we saw how a comet nucleus looks like. And uh, the scientists that made models and so on, this is a 15 kilometers long piece of uh, uh, frozen, uh, frozen material. Um, the scientists who did a model about, about this comet before we actually saw it thought that it would be a very bright object to the extent that we programmed the camera, the onboard camera, to automatically follow a bright object. And you see in this film that the camera followed this spot, not 
the actual nucleus, which we see in the film, follow a very bright spot. The nucleus turns out to be extremely dark. This is super black. It reflects about 5 to 6% of the light. Uh, so it's darker than any black shirt you can wear here. And, uh, and, and scientists were totally surprised by this. Yeah? So this is the first time that a common nucleus was seen, and that's the source of all this uh, gas and dust that then forms these millions of kilometers tail. Um, since then, there's been only four other flybys of comets. In fact, many years later, uh, that was 86, and here you, you see 2001, 2004, 2005, 2010, they're all American spacecraft. But these were all flybys. Flyby means you, you, it's, it's the easiest way of visiting a, an object in interplanetary space. You, you just know the trajectory, you just launch a spacecraft, and you, you pass by the object uh, very quickly. The, so the flyby velocity is very, very high. You talk about, I mean, Giotto was 60 kilometers per second. Uh, the flyby distance, because of the uncertainties, you keep it relatively high, hundreds or thousands of kilometers. And the time, you stay just a few minutes, hours in the proximity of the comet. So all you do, you take a few pictures, you take a few measurements, and, uh, and your mission is over. Now. With Rosetta, we want to do, to do the next step, which was a rendezvous. A rendezvous te technically means you don't only reach the object, but you stay there. And uh, it's easier than uh, what it, it's, it's more difficult than what it looks like. Uh, in order to reach and stay there uh, next to the uh, nucleus of a comet, you have to reach the orbital energy of the nucleus. So you have to give to your spacecraft a lot of energy. Um, and this energy uh, is not enough what you get from the rocket. So we will have to, to use some tricks, and which I'll explain later on. So in uh, 1996, in fact, the, the mission was conceived in the, the idea late 80s. In 93, it was approved. And in 96, ASOC started to work on this. And we were told, OK, you're going to launch. OK, here I'm cheating, because the original launch was uh, uh, 2003. But then there was a problem with the rocket, so we were delayed by one, one year. But more or less, the story, just to make it short in half an hour, I don't tell you the story of the launch delay. But basically, we were told, you're going to launch um, a spacecraft in a 21 days window, just a few years later. You were going to have a 10 years uh, travel. 7 billion kilometers, and we will do four gravity assists with planets. I'll show you what, what I'm talking about there. Two asteroid flybys, and we will reach distances of 800 million kilometers from the sun. And we have a solar array on this spacecraft, and nobody had, had been at these distances before with solar panels. In fact, the record by that time was 200 million kilometers. And you will reach up to 1 billion kilometers from, from Earth, another difficulty in our operations. Then we have to do a rendezvous with a comet and a landing on the, with a comet. So that was the start. It was the task we were given. And this was the object that we were targeting, Comet 67 Pichurium of Gerasimenko. Uh, these were the plates of, of the original discovery of the comet in 1968. And this was a picture we took from Earth in 2003. Uh, again, what you see here, this is just a luminosity map. What you would not see in the nucleus, that, that bright spot is not the nucleus, it's just the, the brightest part of the coma. You don't see what you're getting to. And just to show an analysis of where we were there in 96, these are all the areas we had to tackle, all the, say, areas of expertise, skills, techniques that we needed to do this mission. And what you, where you see green are the things that we could do. We knew how to do, to do them. Mission control, onboard autonomy, mission operations, flight dynamics, ground stations. This was our expertise at ESOC at that time. Uh, then there was a, a yellow area of things that we either had limited uh, uh, expertise. We had done one planet swing by with Giotto and some flight dynamics in interplanetary space, also with Giotto and Ulysses. But Others, we had no idea. But this existed somewhere else. There's a JPL uh, lab in, uh, in California from NASA. They are the gurus of interplanetary missions, and they knew how to do all these things. But then there was this area here where we had no clue, but nobody else in the world had. We had to, in 96, we had to build this expertise in order to achieve basically this final 
objective, which was Comet Orbit and Comet Landing, uh, 18 years later. Yeah? So this was the, the big challenge uh, that we had to tackle. Um, this was the spacecraft that was built, and uh, this picture doesn't show you very much. It's a spacecraft during the thermal test, but just to give you uh, an idea, this is a three meters times two times two and a half, so just a big box. The solar panels are normally attached here, and they go out, very, very big. I have a picture later that shows how big they are. And that's the lander, the landing module, which is on the back of the spacecraft. This is the part that remained in the dark, or we had to keep in the dark throughout throughout the flight. Yeah? Um, just to show you the solar panels, these are the solar panels, 64 square meters in total. This was the biggest we could build, and it was not enough, yeah? because uh, I'll tell you later, we went too far away from the sun. Um, OK, that's the space car we had. And of course, you need a ground segment. This is what we call ground segment. Every mission has a space segment, which is a spacecraft, or one, two more spacecraft and the ground segment. Ground segment is a control center, which is, this is the main control room we have here in Isoc, around the corner. And you need ground stations. And when we started, we didn't even have a ground station. Uh, so we agreed with NASA, they have a nice, uh, uh, very nice network of big antenna, 26, 34, 70 meter antenna um, around the world. They call it Deep Space Network. Uh, so NASA was supposed to track our spacecraft throughout the mission. But at the same time, my boss at that time convinced uh, our money, money, uh, our, our funding agencies uh, and member states to give us money to build an antenna, one, in New Norcia, Australia. And that's what we did. We built an antenna of 35 meters. It was ready in 2001. Um, in the meantime, during the mission, Two more antennae were built, so we have now our own little deep space network. We have three deep space antennae in three very, very uh, strategic places, Spain, Argentina, and Australia, and uh, we can track the, station, the, the, the space cap on our own. Then there is also, of course, a science ground segment. Ground segment. This is the, um, where the people, our colleagues in Spain, collect all the inputs from the scientists that, that want to do something with Rosetta, and they put them together, they agree on a, on a set of activities, they pass them to us, and then we, in ESOC, execute them on the spacecraft. Um, this is an animation of the launch. So it's not an animation, it's a true film. This was on the 2nd of March, 2004, and I just show it, not just because I take a little bit of rest here, but also shows the power that is involved. This is an Ariane 5 launcher. It's one of the most powerful launchers you can have. But this power is not enough to get the spacecraft to the comet. Or maybe to get the spacecraft to the comet, but not to stay there. You have to fly around the sun with the same energy, orbital energy, as a comet. That's not enough. So what did we do? This is the, the journey. You see the white is the trajectory of Rosetta. We started from Earth. One year later, we were back to Earth. Yeah? And there we got a gravitational kick. So the, you use the, basically the angular momentum of, uh, of the Earth around the Sun. You steal a little bit of it, and you accelerate your spacecraft. Then uh, uh, a couple of years later, we used Mars to deviate our trajectory back to Earth because we wanted another kick. And then in 2007, we got another acceleration. You see, our trajectory gets larger. It's because we have more energy. We can go further from the sun. This is the comet. It's passing by the closest point to the sun. We don't care, because we want to reach it with the right velocity. So two years later, back to Earth again, another gravitational kick. I'm talking about kilometers per second acceleration. It's not. It's not peanuts. Yeah? And then here we were fast enough to reach the comet, but we were getting too far from the sun and we had to switch off the spacecraft. Not completely. We had enough power from the solar arrays of about wow, 400 watts um, to keep the vital systems on, but the spacecraft was switched on, off also the attitude control and so on. Hibernation is called. Two and a half years. No signal from the spacecraft, complete silence for two and a half years. Then in January 2014, we woke up again. We were close to the comet, 10 million kilometers, and then we started our real mission. Yes, that's why it took so long, yeah, 10 years, because we had to go five times around the sun, each time meeting another planet, 
and uh, getting this energy that we needed. Now we are there. Now we are there. Since January, we are flying with the comet on this nice and long orbit. We will stay there forever, practically. So I have a few postcards. I like this one. We, we flew by in Mars in February 2007 at 250 kilometers altitude, which was uh, quite a challenge. And in ESA, we had never done a Mars flyby. We did it very, very precisely. And we used the lander. Remember, the lander is mounted on the back, on the dark side of the spacecraft. It's mounted here, basically. This is the back of the spacecraft. And the lander has cameras. We took, you use the camera of the lander to take pictures of the surface of Mars and of Rosetta. This was 2007. This is what today you would call a selfie. Yeah? <laughs> and. Uh, we didn't know at that time, but we were doing a selfie. Um, now, we, in that trip, we crossed twice the asteroid belt. The asteroid belt, I don't know if you're familiar with that, there is a, an area between the orbit of Mars and the orbit of Jupiter, which is full of little debris. Yeah, this is 130 kilometers big, it's not that little, but um, uh, they are called asteroids probably a planet that didn't form or a planet that uh, was disintegrated in the past. Anyway, uh, we flew by, we, we crossed this belt twice and uh, in, we took the occasion to do a flyby of asteroids so we could test some techniques and of course also do some um, secondary science. Um, then we came to the hibernation and hibernation means, as I showed you before, we reach distances from the sun. That's the sun. The blue is the Earth orbit. The brown is the comet orbit. And this was our trajectory. Uh, we were too far. and We had to switch off the spacecraft. Now, to switch off the spacecraft, we had to spin it up so that it would be, say, dynamically stable, and then stay there, point more or less uh, to the sun, the, 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 the solar panels, throughout this arc. Yeah, fortunately, it's very slow, so it doesn't change very fast. And, uh, but we had no contact anymore. The antenna, by spinning, the antenna was not pointing the Earth anymore. And the transmitter, we had to switch off because we had no power. So this, are, this is the last signal we got from Rosetta. This is noise. And these are peaks when the antenna was strobing the Earth during this rotation. By analyzing these peaks, peaks the, the, the frequency, the height, we, we could tell, yes, the spacecraft is okay, is in the right attitude, is in the right rotation. Then we switched off the transmitter, 8th of June 2011, and then no signal anymore for two and a half years, which is not nice, especially for people like us. Our job, we are, we are remote controllers. Yeah? We sit there and our, our obje objects are far away. So remote controllers without signal from their spacecraft, you can imagine. It's not really nice. We've never done that before for so long. Uh, we had put a timer on board for the 20th of January 2014. And this timer, we had some inaccuracies, of course, the clock uh, drift and also some activity. The timer would kick off several activities before it would come to the point that it could send a, a signal to Earth. He had to stop the rotation. So first activate the, the propulsion system automatically, then stop the rotation, then uh, acquire the sun, three-axis stabilization, then point the Earth in the direction of Earth, switch on the transmitter, and then we, we could receive the signal. So it took uh, a long time. So we had an inaccuracy of about one hour. We said, the signal is going to come at 7 o'clock in the evening, plus or minus half an hour. So this is myself and the flight director at that time, Andrea Comazzo, at the beginning of this uh, hour. Yeah? And this is just a little bit later. So it's around 7 o'clock. This was the middle of the window. And the signal didn't come. Yeah? Uh, about 7.15, <laughs> <laughs> this was us. Yeah? I tell you, this was, we, we saw these pictures afterward. We were really following the same line of thoughts. Yeah? <laughs> so the signal arrived uh, 90, uh, so 19 minutes after the middle of the window, so 45 minutes after the beginning of the window, and 11 minutes before the end due to a software bug, yeah, <laughs> uh, which we knew afterwards. But then the signal arrived. And this peak here over the noise, over two ground stations, told us basically that the spacecraft was in an excellent state. Because all those activities I described had happened. In order to get this signal, they must have worked. So 80% of the spacecraft we knew was working. So this was the reaction, yeah, everybody. 
So this, I, I, keep, I, I spend a few minutes on this because apart from the fact that it's funny, but it is, this was the key moment of the mission. Everybody watched the landing and all these things and all the press, but this was alles oder nichts. Yeah? So it was really uh, binary, yeah? zero or one. And uh, we, we, were, we were really lucky there. But then the work had to start, the difficult part of the work. This is the phase where nobody had really done that before. So we were really pioneering here. The first picture of the comet taken by Rosetta, you, you recognize the comet there, of course. Uh, on the 20th of March, this is two months later, they wake up. Yes, it was very slow because we were still very far from the sun and we had no power and so on. Five million of kilometers distance from the comet. Um, in June, we could resolve more than one pixel. And here we were a bit puzzled. This, are, this is a film of various pictures taken over many hours. Uh, start speculating about mutation of the comet and so on until uh, we could, in July, resolve this thing. And this was another big surprise. Nobody expected this sort of, bah, uh, well, gummy ente, they called it. Or, <laughs> yeah. Uh, rubber duck or uh, in fact at this stage there was quite a lot of interpolation in these images so we didn't even know yet whether these were two objects orbiting each other this would have been a disaster we would have never been able to land on it with if it was two objects fortunately the two objects if they are two objects they are close together they, they are touched yeah so the rotation is 12 hours it's not that fast uh, but 12 hours 12.4 and then finally we arrived we stopped at 100 kilometers distance uh, in August last year, 6th of August 2014. You see better and better pictures of the comet. And here started the navigation around the comet, which was uh, really the, the, the big novelty. You see here, we had a, an error of 2% in a small correction maneuver, and so immediately we lost the, the comet from the field of view. You have to be extremely accurate when you navigate around these things. Um, we took a few pictures here from 100 kilometers. You see, it's quite a, quite an impressive uh, surface. You see the the valley between the two things. The scientists are still discussing whether these are two things that came together or whether this is really erosion that is going to separate them out. But okay, this is we give them time. And people complain that we only take black and white pictures. So this is a color picture. Yeah. <laughs> So you can compare it, yeah? This is black and white, and this is color. And, and by the way, uh, the comet is much darker than this. I told you, it's, it's really dark. This is stretched uh, contrast, yeah? Um, if I showed the real contrast, you would hardly detect it from, from the rest of the black sky. Yeah? Again, this thing reflects 6% of the light. It's really very, very dark. We stretch the, context, the, the contrast in order to see the surface uh, features. Yeah? But that's a color picture. Um, to give you an, uh, an idea of the dimensions, uh, this is a picture of the Mont Blanc taken from 100 kilometers distance. And that's where we were when we took that, that uh, picture, 100 kilometers. So this is the, gives an impression of what is uh, the size, if you want to see it over London. Still, it's a mountain. It's not bigger than that, yeah? But it's also not that, that small, so for example, we don't, still don't know where the lander is. We haven't taken pictures of it. It's not so, so such a small object. Now, we stopped at 100 kilometers because we couldn't orbit it. We didn't know anything about this object. So the first thing we had to do is determine the mass. So what we did was these funny trajectories, 100 kilometers in August, and then we went to 50, and by measuring the bending of our trajectory, these are hyperbolic arcs, by measuring the bending of the trajectory by the gravity, the tiny gravity of this thing, we could determine the mass. We've done a 100 kilometer triangle, then a 50 kilometer triangle, and at this stage we knew the mass. So we could try a circular orbit. And we did that, so we went into a circular orbit of 30 kilometers, which is this one here. Then because the the gravity is so small, you can also do nice things that you can forget about around the planet, like this. You can change the inclination. Yeah, it's easy. You just operate your onboard thrusters just a few millimeters per second, a few centimeters per second, and you change the inclination. So we could see and take pictures of the comet. We had to characterize the, the, the object. 
not only the surface, but everything, all the parameters around it, because otherwise you cannot navigate around it. Navigation means every day I predict where I'm going to be in 12 hours, and then I uplink commands to perform the activities over this trajectory. And then in 12 hours, I correct the prediction continuously, and I correct the orbit. So this was the difficult thing. We had to learn how to fly while we were flying. And this has very little to do with normal space flight. When you're, when you're doing space flight, you are uh, next to a big object, the Earth, the Sun, which dominates your trajectory. Easy, eh? and everything else is perturbations. The, you know where you're going to be tomorrow within a very good accuracy, because the rest is perturbation, the radiation pressure of the sun, the drag of the atmosphere, it's very easy. Here, all the forces acting on our spacecraft were perturbations. They're all of the same, same, amount, same order of magnitude. And, uh, and you have to take the gravity, the shape of the comet, the pressure of the dust, the pressure of the gas, the pressure of the sun, they're all equivalent. And we had to model this. This was never done before. This was really very difficult. Um, so that's, I go, I try to go a bit faster. After determining the, the, the mass, we had to fly close to it. And in order to fly close to it, our measurement of where Rosetta is, is very precise. But the measurement of where the comet is, is not precise. Here we have radio frequency measurements, quite accurate. This thing has no transponder on board. There's no transmitter, no receiver. So you cannot do measurements there. So what, is, what counts for us is the relative position and velocity between Rosetta and the comet. So to do that, we had to do what we call uh, optical navigation. So we developed a digital model of the comet. That's not pictures. Yeah? It's a digital model. And uh, um, we identified landmarks. And first manually and then automatically, uh, we take various pictures of the surface and our software compares the landmarks and by doing triangulations, yeah, uh, it, it determines where Rosetta is with respect to the comet. And then we can model the trajectory in the future. So this is, if you think about it, it's the other way around as GPS. Yeah? You are here with a receiver, you get signals from three spacecraft, you know where the spacecraft are, you do triangulation and you determine where you are. Here, it was a spacecraft, and looking at the landmarks, it determines where it is compared to the landmarks. So this is all completely new, developed here in ESO. And we had to do it quickly because we had to land. And uh, we had to land in November because we knew the comet was coming closer to the sun and the activity was starting, and uh, we knew that uh, uh, we couldn't go close enough if the activity was, uh, was um, ongoing. Yeah? So we wanted to land to drop this little lander uh, while the comet was still relatively quiet. So we had not very much time. This is the first space mission that selected its own landing site. All missions of the past had precursors. Yeah? When the, the Americans went to the moon, there were plenty of missions that went and photographed and made measurements. And then finally, they could go and land there. Here, we had no clue. We had to discover it all ourselves in a few months. Selection of the landing site was very complex. You had to take into account uh, uh, local horizontal, the trajectory, of course, the illumination, and so on. So it was not easy to select the landing site. Uh, eventually, the choice went to, to this place here, which is better picture here, and we had a very large error ellipse because the lander is not a controlled landing. The lander is just a drop. We just threw the, land, uh, threw the lander to the surface, yeah, like, like throwing a stone. And so the whole trajectory was determined by the initial conditions, which was the velocity and position of Rosetta, and attitude of Rosetta at the moment of separation. So this required an incredibly accurate navigation. And the error still was very big. Was why I think it was a circle of almost one kilometer radius. So quite a big error. And as you can see, there was no real landing runway. Yeah? The, the ter terrain was very, very rough. Um, now, the night of the 12th of November is uh, the day of the 12th of November. The night before was the tough one. We had the landing. This is the trajectory. We were coming from a 30 kilometers circular orbit. We went up to there, we did a maneuver to dive towards the comet, and then we separated the lander, which then dropped onto the surface, and then we went away in order to have a better visibility. Uh, so 11 hours before the separation, we 
did the last orbit determination. We knew that we were on the right orbit, accurate enough. Seven hours before, our colleague of the FILE, because FILE is not controlled by us, okay, it's controlled by us via Rosetta, but the guys who are in charge are our colleagues of DLR in uh, Köln. They said, FILE is ready, so go again. Two hours before, we did this maneuver, diving towards the comet, and here we had uh, very little time. Uh, imagine we've done all this at a distance of a bit more than 500 million kilometers. The signal that tells you that this thing has happened it used to take half an hour to get to us, 28 minutes. So when you do the maneuver two hours before separation and you want to check that the maneuver was right before you separate, first you have to wait half an hour that the signal arrives. Then you have to carefully, okay, quickly look at the, at the trajectory, the results and say, okay, it's fine. And then you have to send a signal to Rosetta to say, okay, now you can separate, which will take another half an hour there. Yeah? So this was really super critical, these two hours here. Fortunately, Rosetta, and this, you, you work with machines, you know that this happens. Rosetta did the best, the best, the most accurate maneuver ever there when we needed it. Yeah? The Rosetta knew that it had to do the best there, and it did. Um, so, separation at T0, then we did a maneuver to escape the, 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 the trajectory, and then we turned to Phile, which was dropping. It took seven hours, so this was dropping for seven hours. Uh, and we took pictures and we picked up the signal. This was vital because Phile cannot transmit data to Earth. It, has, it can only transmit data to Rosetta. The transmitter is too weak, it has no big antenna, it's very light. So, um, it was important for us to pick up the signal from Phile, and we did. This was two hours before separation, and we saw the landing. Again, just to give you an idea of this, of this uh, thing, imagine you, are, you have a, a plane that is flying over a mountain at twice the altitude of a normal airliner. Yeah? We were here at 22 kilometers, 0.5 altitude from the surface. And you went to hit a one kilometer circle, yeah, by just dropping a box. Yeah? <laughs> and you do this remote controlling from Jupiter because you are 500 million kilometers away. Yeah? <laughs> and in advance, programmed, it's not in real time, of course. So just to tell you, this was more or less the, the type of, of uh, thing that we had to do. Uh, this is an animation of the separation. This is really at the right speed. It was 18 centimeters per second, the separation mechanism. Just pushed it away. Yeah? Then we did the maneuver, we went away, and this thing was dropping open its uh, three legs, some booms, uh, oriented correctly the thing, and it had a, a flywheel to keep it in the right attitude, but no control of the trajectory. The comet was rotating below it. Uh, here I take a, a little bre a breath, yeah, and because uh, it takes one and a half minute, this video here, but it's good, yeah. I'm running a bit behind, but okay. So now you see it from the perspective of Phile. Again, did exactly the same. It's just a repetition of what you saw before, but now it's Phile that sees the thing now going down, and uh, the comet rotates below, and uh, it's gonna go to the to the landing site. And what is important is the end of this animation, because as you can imagine. With no gravity, this thing touched down at uh, almost one meter per second, and uh, you had to find a way to anchor the space, the, the, the lander. Uh, otherwise, it bounces back. So it had a mechanism, two mechanisms, in fact. A harpoons to be shot. As soon as it would touch down, it would shoot harpoons through the surface to anchor. And then a, a, a little gas uh, rocket on top to press it down. Yeah? So, great. That's exactly what should have done, yeah? <laughs> um, now, uh, these are pictures, we saw them afterwards, pictures of Phile approach, just falling, you see Phile here, Appro it's a mosaic of three pictures approaching the landing site, perfect, yeah? You see it in a few minutes uh, distance from each other. Here you see pictures that Phile took during the landing, uh, the last, these are taken from a few meters. I think the last one was from nine meters altitude, yeah? And that's really, the, it has a camera below, so these pictures were taken and uh, uh, from that camera. And 
when we analyzed that, that's the, the, the area where it touched down, we were only 120 meters away from the center. So this was extremely accurate. If you remember, our nominal landing ellipse was about one kilometer radius. We went 120 meters, so we were super happy. And we ended up exactly in a flat place where we wanted to land. Uh, but uh, this is a bad quality picture, but it shows what our navigation camera, which is not a super telescope, so it's so at the time of landing, first of all, this is the shadow of a cloud of dust. Very good. But then you see here, in, in one bright uh, pixel and one dark pixel, we see Philae and its shadow. So the, the thing had not anchored, it had, it had bounced away. That's exactly what we, we didn't want to happen. <laughs> yeah? And uh, if you had asked me before, I would have said, well, if you had asked me what happens if the harpoons don't work or the rocket doesn't work, in fact, both didn't work, um, what would happen? I would have said we would, the mission would be lost, the, the, the Philae mission would be lost. Of course, Rosetta would continue. It would have been a shame. We were being very lucky anyway. So he, this is not a mosaic. It's a single picture where you see the footprint of the touchdown in the dust and Philae flying away. This is eight minutes after the landing. So it's really bouncing away, this thing. And we didn't realize, by the way, because the signal didn't break. We were so happy to have the signal. Philae started operating, doing all its uh, scientific measurements. Uh, but uh, it was not standing, it was just bouncing. Yeah? Um, this is, uh, I like this thing because it's our sign on the comet. The, yeah? And uh, wait, I, I compare it to the footprint on the moon. Uh, so I'm very proud of this, yeah. Uh, but okay, we had bounced away. Eventually, and this is where we've been very lucky for, after two hours, it stopped. And it stopped in a, in a, in a corner which on one side is dark, so uh, it didn't allow Philae to recharge the batteries. Uh, so Philae had been designed very properly by its uh, designers. Since we didn't know what it would uh, have on the surface, we didn't know how much dust is on the surface of a comet. Nobody knew. So when it was designed, they said, OK, we don't know if the solar cells will be enough to recharge the batteries. We give it a big battery that will make it operate for 60 hours. And in the 60 hours, we do all the basic experiments. Yeah, there are 10 experiments, and we run them all. If we have uh, power on the, on the solar cells, we then continue. Of course, we were all hoping to get power. That's why it took so long also to select the landing site to get the right illumination. Well, we ended up in a dark corner, and this prevented the continuation beyond the prime mission. But the prime mission was done. 60 hours on the batteries, this is very good. An advantage of this is that it ended up close to these formations. My scientists forbid me to call them rocks, because they're not rock. This is frozen dust yeah, and ice. and uh, So it's not really rock. It looks like rock. Um, and this is where they would have liked to land, but we said, no, we're not going to land. <laughs> <laughs> so Phil eventually went where they want. So their, their measurements were very, very exciting. Unfortunately, only for 60 hours. Yeah. Um, well, think about it. This is the oldest material in the solar system. Yeah? This is probably four and a half billion years. Yeah? And this is 25 years. <laughs> 20, maybe. Um, just to show, this is also very stretched contrast. These are the, the rocks around it, yeah, or the, sorry, the formations around it, and, uh, but very dark, unfortunately. But OK, they, they got a lot of information out of this as well. This is where we think we are. We don't know. Eh? We have radio measurements. We have not been able to take pictures of Philae from, from uh, Rosetta to know exactly where it is. So it's in this area. The red dot up there was our original landing site. It's gone across more than a kilometer across the head. We've been very lucky that it, that it got stuck there. OK, the, that's Philae. Now, but the Rosetta mission continued. The, the bulk of the Rosetta mission is the spacecraft. It's not the Philae. Philae was anyway just a part of it. Um, and it did it 60 hours, and that's it. But on board, we wanted to stay close to a comet for more than a year and observe the evolution of the comet. This was the whole purpose of the mission, rendezvous, stay there. So we have done, we are doing uh, various fantastic images, uh, analyzing the surface. This is a nice one where we took, a, we caught a, the shadow of Rosetta on the comet. This was a six kilometers uh, altitude uh, back in February. 
Uh, this I like very much. It's a peak on uh, the comet. You see this peak, you say, wow. First thing you think is uh, uh, base jumping here. Yeah? And, uh, but imagine, I can't imagine anything more boring than this. Uh, somebody calculated, this is about 100 meter high. Somebody calculated, if you just jump without any parachute, it would take you 20 minutes. To <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And by the way, you have to be careful not to jump. You, you just do a jump of four centimeters and you have enough escape velocity to get lost in space. <laughs> so, okay. It's a very strange environment. Yeah. Uh, we, are, we are observing, this is thanks to, this, to the comet that has these explosions, these geysers uh, that explode from when it heats up from the interior. Uh, we see the interior. These are, you see, 40 meters, 50 meters. You see this formation. These are like three meters uh, big uh, balls or whatever. I don't know how you want to call it. Some, someone calls them, calls them goose, goose bumps. Yeah? Uh, also here, uh, the interior of the comet has a structure that nobody can explain today. Uh, and, and, uh, and this is one of the things we are, our scientists are so excited about. Uh, we collect, from Rosetta, we, on board, we collect dust particles. Also, the consistency of these dust particles is very surprising. They're very, very fluffy, like, uh, like snow. We do plasma measurements. We do, of course, uh, isotopic measurements, the famous story about the water. So the isotopic composition of the water of this comet has nothing to do with the one on Earth. So at the moment, we are collecting so much information, and we are basically um, say, throwing away all the theories about comets, but now uh, the scientists will need time to construct the new ones. But we are really uh, revolution revolutionizing the comet science. In the meantime, 13th of June or 14th of June, uh, Philae woke up. Totally surprisingly, we, we, we knew the, Philae wa the comet was warming up, the season was changing, so the illumination was changing on the comet, and uh, uh, we knew that Philae would get more illumination, but it had been seven months at temperatures of minus 100 degrees. Try to leave your laptop in these conditions. And, uh, and um, so I, we, we had already sort of given up, well, it, but we were listening, and it woke up. It woke up for a number of passes, uh, this is the type of signals we got. Two minutes, then nothing, then two minutes, 15 minutes later. Very strange behavior. Our colleagues in uh, Köln are still trying to understand what it did. Uh, we did uh, analysis of where was the orientation that was the best to get signal. Well, each green point is, is one of the contacts. But really, uh, we haven't got any useful contact, or some, some data, some useful contact with, uh, with Phile. Uh, the last one was at, on the 9th of July, and then we haven't heard anything more, but on the 9th of July, it was time to go away. We were already at very large, dis or relatively large distances, 150 kilometers, but then the activity of the comet was growing, you see it there, and uh, we had to push away. Why? Mainly because Rosetta has these things, they're called star trackers, uh, and uh, they, they that little telescopes, they take pictures of the sky, they recognize with a sky, star's map where, what the orientation of Rosetta is in the sky. They are vital for the survival of the spacecraft. And uh, in, that, in that environment, with all the dust around, what these things see is this. Yeah? So this is a few pictures one after the other. Try to detect what is a star and what is not. And actually, they have uh, software on board by the way, imagine these things were built uh, 15 years ago, and the software developed maybe 12 years ago. Uh, there is software that can discriminate uh, things that are moving too fast from things that are fixed, and uh, so it can filter out up to 1,000 um, dust grains. Yeah, But here it's getting more than 10,000, and then uh, either it crashes or it gets totally confused, so we had to go away. We are flying now at 400 kilometers distance. Uh, by the way, there are pieces of the comet that flow away as well. We don't know how big this is because we don't know at what distance it was, but it could be up to 40 meter big. Yeah, So it's not a bad idea to stay away in this moment. Yeah? And uh, yeah, you see, uh, this is a few pictures uh, which show suddenly these explosions. You see when the comet turns in one direction, 
uh, we see it again, I think. Yeah, you see these explosions. These are like geysers explosions. This is, was a fantastic one. These pictures are taken 18 minutes from each other. This is stretched. That's the normal contrast, basically. And you see this huge uh, explosion of, it's really gas, uh, mainly water vapor that builds up pressure under the surface and then blows everything um, into the sky. And this stuff goes very fast away. So where are where are we now? We are uh, the comet rotates like this. Uh, this is the area where we should be really up there if we wanted to talk to the to the lander. But we want to do other things now. We want to do science. We want to do it at the southern latitudes. So we're going around. Yeah, this is the the various orbits we are doing around the comet. We are about 400 degree, 400 kilometers away today, and we are here. Uh, well, on this on this uh, arc here, I think this was tu last Tuesday, and this is uh, next Tuesday. Yeah. So uh, our science mission continues, and uh, our next uh, milestones are: well, we stay a safe distance for a long time uh, until the activity goes down. In October, we do a long planned uh, what we call coma excursion. So we want we go into the tail of the comet to see the structure of the tail at. 1,500 kilometers from uh, from the surface. We plan latest. We expect in March next year to go back to circular orbits close to the, to, to the comet, and in September we will finish the mission because together with the comet we are on that large orbit. We are again approaching a point where we would we're too far from the sun. We would have to switch off the spacecraft again, hibernate it again, and it doesn't make any sense at that time. We have less fuel. A big risk. We would have to switch it off for four years. So we think uh, it's time to finish the mission there, and uh, we are thinking of spiraling down to the surface and eventually sort of land Rosetta on the surface. But um, we are we are discussing that there. Uh, I'm through. Five minutes longer than I thought. These are various websites. What I like very much is this the blog. I look at it at least once a week. I learn from it a lot of you know things that either scientific things, which is not our job, or things that my team doesn't tell me anymore. And I, <laughs> yeah, I learn it there. Yeah? And, uh, and uh, all the rest. But this, you, if you type on, uh, on a search machine, ESA Rosetta blog, you find it. I, I really recommend it. It's really nice. You can comment or whatever. Uh, this is some pictures of my team because you know I'm here telling the story, but these guys are are uh, still working day and night, and they grew with me because you know I hired them uh, uh, 15 years ago, and uh, and now these these people are are really doing the work, and they are uh, uh, unique. Yeah, um, and this is it. Another selfie. Yeah, I just have to say this is a selfie when the lander was still attached to a, took this picture of Rosetta and of the comet. So this is the collection combination to the to the original selfie that's it thank you very much this looks like not yeah. very briefly what i've been asked to do if i manage uh, is to give you a, a couple of ideas of uh, how you work well, uh, how you can get to work at ESOC. Yeah, I want to go very fast because we wanted to have a few picture questions and maybe I can go till six fifteen or something like this. Okay, yeah, I, it's it's my wife is. Uh, <laughs> 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 Sorry. Uh, um, so, ESA. 22 member states, uh, uh, we had eight sites, we have about 2,200 staff, um, about 4.5 billion euro budget, which sounds a lot. Uh, it's not that that big. It's basically twice as much as the budget of M Mrs. Merkel for the Bundeskanzler, um, for example. So it's not too bad. Uh, uh, we have, okay, that's, uh, we have launchers, satellites, and uh, we are operating about 20 satellites. Uh, these are our sites. ESOC is the control center, but we have an administration headquarters in Paris. We have a technology center in Nordwijk, astronaut center in Cologne, 
uh, in Rome we have uh, Earth Observation Center, Scientist Center in, in uh, ESAC, plus of course the ground stations. So lots of places around the world. Uh, we have done since 1967, so we have a long history, we have uh, supported 63 launches um, and we have ex supported also external missions. So we have about 800 staff of which 300 are ESA, but we work very integrated with a lot of companies that send expertise, so our contractor companies, and I'm insisting on this because that's the easiest way to get into ESA, okay? it's through a contractor company. Specialized in ground segments, software, hardware, antenna, communications, but also uh, space cap operations. Uh, our areas is development of the ground infrastructure for the operation of uh, oops of ESA missions, uh, the operation itself, uh, the coordination of satellite operations throughout Europe with other agencies, and uh, we develop standards and we are very active in space debris investigation. Um, so these are our main areas. We are flying today 15 satellites plus four outside ESOC and uh, we are preparing many other exciting missions. I don't have time but I, I could tell you a lot about these uh, missions there. Um, just the main events of this year, uh, we have uh, LEOP means launch and early orbit phases so we have supported the launch of uh, the four satellites and we are coming up next week on Friday, Friday morning we launch another pair of Galileo satellites then we follow LISA Pathfinder, Sentinel-3, this is all the activities planned for uh, for this year, the main activities of course in the meantime we have to operate all the flying spacecraft and now in terms of career, so we are in ESOC we deal with ground segment and operations. If you want to build a satellite, you don't have to come to ESO. Yeah, you go to industry or you go to STEC in Nordvik, they, they follow the project. But here you are there to fly the spacecraft, so you are the, the pilots if you want. Um, if you see here are the type of expertise we typically use in ESA. Of course we have lawyers as well and we have, uh, but I'm talking about technical expertise. Yeah. If you're a lawyer, you, maybe you're not here, or maybe you are, but I don't know. But uh, the, um, so and these are the areas where we utilize these people. Yeah? Exploitation, we don't do very much exploitation, which is using the data. We, we fly the space car, we produce the data, we give them to the universities, to the, whoever wants this data in Europe. It's true for science, it's true for Earth observation, and so on. So, but of course we support exploitation. And the operations engineering, of course, is mainly the field here, but we have a lot of uh, uh, software, mechanical, electrical, communication engineering as well. This is very important. It's the split of nationality, you say, who cares? But it's very important because ESA has 22 member states. Each contributes uh, with a certain rule in money. And each expects to have equivalent back uh, the amount of money in contracts, but also the amount of staff. Now, we're very flexible with that, uh, but there are overrepresented and underrepresented countries. So, for example, today, if you are Italian or French or Spanish, you have difficulties to get a job in ESA. Yeah? Uh, if you're German, no. If German, they are underrepresented today. So, I'm just telling you this. Yeah? Uh, now, mm, for students and graduates, I'm not sure if this is the right uh, uh, forum, but uh, I thought it's full of young people. We have intern internships, uh, we have uh, a very nice program which is called YGT, Young Graduate Trainee, is oriented to people who really have hardly any experience, they come out of university and uh, we keep the, oh, I have a few details uh, later on. We have research fellowships, in ESOC not many. And we have also this PhD network partner initiative. You need your university to support. You have to be a PhD student there. Uh, so for the internships, we offer them to master degree students, three to six months. You can prepare your thesis and uh, uh, they're not paid. Basically you get really, uh, I don't know, 10 euro, 20 euro per day, but it's, they're not paid basically. Um, the, YGTs, that's very, very attractive. It's very, uh, uh, sorry, very competitive because we get uh, thousands of, uh, of uh, applications. We have about uh, 80 
opportunities per year and we have uh, an average of 1700 applications and uh, okay this is a paid job and it's a very nice way to get into ESA not necessarily after one year it's very rare that you get converted the, the job into a ESA staff position but you have acquired expertise and uh, you can get easily in, into any of our contractor companies and that's a bridge until there is a position in ESA positions in ESA are these days a bit rare and this is for space employment, just to give you an idea, that is still a bit growing, although there was a, a bit of a low in the, a few years ago. And uh, before I finish this, I want to say again, if somebody is interested to work in a place like ESOC, we have this big reservoir of uh, contractor companies. By the way, they're all located around ESOC, more or less. And uh, uh, that's normally the, the easiest way. One gets a contract uh, there, then gets his foot into ESOC, then is known, is familiar, and when there is an opportunity, is taken in there. I don't know if that's enough. I wanted to go a bit quick, but if, of course, if you have questions on this, I'm ready to answer. And uh, yeah, open to questions. Thank you. Okay, on the trajectory is uh, hardly any, of, of course it does, yeah, the answer is yes. But you have to remember that this thing is uh, a, about 10 billion tons. Although it's very light, yeah, this, uh, this thing, if you throw it in the ocean, it, uh, the, the comet, you throw it in the ocean, it floats. The density is less than half of the water, yeah, so it's light. But overall it's still a mountain, so it weighs about 10 billion tons. So that activity is Yes, it does uh, modify the, the, the trajectory, but it, the, the, the effect is not measurable by us. What it does, it modifies the rotation. And uh, uh, we see the rotation speed changes by, I mean, in these days, it changes by 10 seconds per day. Yeah. So every day, it, sometimes it accelerates, sometimes it decelerates. So you, we see the torque, the torque on the comet. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, okay, we were very aware of this problem. It was the first long duration mission that we were, I mean, when you, when you start a normal mission, after a few months you are in operation. And that's it, what you do now is very similar to what you're gonna do in the following year. So even if people leave, it's a continuous retraining, it's not a problem. In this case, we would launch and be a very quiet with some highlights for 10 years. And the real stuff was coming at the end. So we knew about this problem. Um, I don't have a single recipe, but we did various things. First of all, we postponed developments as much as we could to the, to the crews, so that people normally for a, for a ground segment preparation, they work before the launch, the whole development, everything is prepared before launch, and then in, after launch, it's operated. Here we postponed various things. All these techniques of navigation at the Comet, we did them just a couple of years ago. Yeah, because we knew, had we developed them then, maybe we would have lost the experts and so on. So we, we waited with that. This was one measure. Another measure was uh, uh, we got a satellite model. This is also not uh, usual. Novitsky, you've seen it, maybe some of you. Uh, a copy, fully functional, of the, model, of the spacecraft in ESOC. These models are built for every spacecraft. They are called engineering models, but normally then when the spacecraft is launched, they are cannibalized. Yeah? They are used for other projects. So they kept it and gave it to ESOC. So we used it for proficiency training continuously. Now, the third thing that we did, and this was, let's say, it helped us. Rosetta, uh, when it was uh, started, was only one interplanetary mission. 
but thanks to the development work of Rosetta, we could uh, we got approved two more missions, which are very similar in terms of spacecraft, hardware, and software. Uh, Venus Express and Mars Express. Venus Express finished last year. Mars Express is still around Mars. Uh, thanks to these uh, uh, children missions, we could uh, um, give career opportunities to our experts um, that would keep them. Yeah, because no matter how much you pay people or how much you keep them busy, ten years is a long time. In the in the worst in the, in the best case, they are still there like me, they, but they go into management positions. Yeah, and you can't use them anymore. Yeah, so I'm basically <laughs> I'm, so. Um, we gave them career opportunities in other missions so they would come back. So, for example, the flight director of the arrival was my... De so we have, a, we have a hierarchy, we have the space cab operations manager and the flight director who are the leading positions for the mission. When, I, when we launched, I was the space cab operations manager, my deputy was Andrea Comazzo, then I moved to the flight director position, he became the, the, the space cab operations manager, but in between, he went and did Venus Express. So I kept him in my area by giving him another opportunity. Otherwise, it was boring to stay in there. But then he came back. Sylvain Lodio, who is now the Space Cup Operations Manager, uh, left even ESOC. When we, when we could launch in 2003, um, he, he went away because his wife wanted to go back to France and so on. Yeah? And, uh, um, but he came back because, OK, that's the other thing. A mission like this is like a magnet. Yeah, you have one opportunity in life to work on a mission like this, so uh, people get attached. So it's a number of things. Yeah, give career opportunity, but but keep them linked, and uh, and give training structures and um, and uh, the, the, the the postpone the developments so that some of the expertise that you need at the end is actually built up close to the end. See what we did. Um, eventually, yeah, uh, we had a case of Huygens in the late 90s. We launched the spacecraft. The team that was there at launch was totally, totally different from the team at arrival, which was uh, seven years later. For Rosetta, I was there from 96. OK, at that time, I was the head of operations. I was not anymore in the control team, but I was there. Uh, Akomatsu was there from the launch team. Silvan Lodio was there from the launch team. We have a large number of people that we managed to keep by moving them around. But you can't think of keeping a person for 10 years in that place. This is forget it. I like this, yeah. First question, uh, what uh, did we have to take into account relativistic effects in, uh, in our work? And second question is, uh, do you estimate the probability of, uh, of a hit when you cross the asteroid belt? The second one is easier. Uh, the asteroid belt is not that thick as you can imagine. Uh, but uh, yes, what you, there is a thing, oh, I can't remember what's his name. Uh, you calculate there's a, there's a radius around any object where there is a statistically a higher probability of having debris around this object. So when you fly by an asteroid, you try not to get into this radius. And it depends on the mass, it depends on the size, and so on. It's a Ross radius, I forgot. Okay, you calculate that, and you avoid that you go in there. Because there, there's really a, a, a rapid increase of the probability of having even, I mean, with those speeds, even a, a grain of dust can kill your spacecraft. So that's what you do. But um, between one object and the next, there are thousands, millions of kilometers, no problem. Yeah? So all you do, you stay away from this uh, imaginary sphere around the object, which is maybe 5,000 kilometers. Yeah? You stay away, and that's OK, statistically. Uh, uh, the, the other question, relativistic. OK, of course, first of all, we live with relativity 
all the time because we have to work with the speed of light. The speed of light is since Einstein uh, was there, the speed of light is uh, constant. So all our propagation delays are calculated like this. But for example, time measurement. Time measurement, and there I'm just telling you two words because I don't know anything about that. But time measurement is uh, uh, a very complex thing when you fly interplanetary flight because um, all your events and all your things depend on time. Yeah? And uh, time is affected not only by, by well, the speed of light and so on, but time is affected by gravity. So there is a thing called, uh, whatever, paricentric time. Is, uh, it, has, it has a definition. And basically, the, our time reference is, on the, uh, is as if our clock was in the barycenter of the solar system. And this changes because the planets keep moving. So all your time reference is based on this uh, barycentric time. So you calculate your time reference depending, assuming that your clock was in the barycenter of the solar system. Now, this is something for people that like dealing with the fifth or tenth number after the commas, but you need it. You need it for this. So I don't know if it answers. There are other other things, but mainly mainly the Im impact on time is is where we had uh, the major relativistic things. Gravity? No, yeah. You mean uh, Lorentz contraction or things like? No, 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 no. No, that's very negligible. I I don't think we ever considered that. No, no. But uh, from gravity, yes. Uh, tra travel, what did I say? Well, uh, I don't know, I, I must... Oh. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's, that's just simply, these solar panels at Earth, okay, what was the problem with the power supply from the solar arrays? Now, these solar panels are designed uh, with an output of about 8 kilowatts at Earth distances. When you go at 1 billion or 800 million kilometers from the sun, this decreases to something like 3 or 400 watts, yeah, in a with a perfectly working solar array, yeah. Um, because of this, we needed at least 600 watts to keep all systems active, so we had to switch off systems, yeah. Now, that's in presence of a perfectly healthy solar array. Since it was two and a half years, solar rays tend to degrade in space because they get bombarded by charged particles, so they degrade. So we had to calculate that, so estimate the potential degradation. You get a solar flare and suddenly your solar, your, your solar ray output goes down significantly by a few percent. Um, so we had to model this. In fact, uh, it turned out that the degradation was close to zero. What we got out two and a half years later was almost identical to what we, we had two and a half years earlier. So we didn't have, at least in this area, we didn't have uh, real problems, but uh, by design, it was not sufficient. By design. Yeah, maybe first. Yeah, well, well, yeah. Uh, in many of these activities, you have one try, which is correct. Yeah, uh, how do you tackle that? We do um, well. We do two things. Of course, we do a lot of testing. Yeah, but then we do a validation campaign through what we call simulations. Yeah, for example, the asteroid flyby is the typical example. You just fly by this thing. You know it's going to happen on that moment. You're going to be at 15 kilometers per second. Uh, relative uh, velocity and you're going to be at maybe 20 minutes uh, signal propagation time so there's no way that you can intervene when you see the things happening it's already 20 minutes ago yeah? so no way uh, so what we do we run these things on ground with simulators many times we develop procedures we run them on the simulator do, then we do another test we update the procedure we run it so we do what we call procedure validation through a simulator and uh, yeah, in uh, in ESOC also for missions that have a second try, we we also test, we, we also train the people on simulation campaigns a lot. So when there is a launch, the the critical phases last maybe two or three days. We simulate for three four months, twice a week. We put the team there. We go through all the scenarios. There is a guy in the cellar 
that injects in the simulator failures and we have to recognize them, we have to interact uh, properly. So, validation and, uh, and simulation. And you wanted to? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, there is no decision yet, but I have to empty the building because we are getting a, 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 a another engineering model for Solar Orbiter, latest, I think, in 2018. So we have time. But uh, yeah, it would not be the first spacecraft that we put in a museum. I worked on a spacecraft in the 90s, which is called Eureka, it's now in uh, Luzern. Uh, so, yeah, most likely we will try to have an agreement with the museum and put it there. I don't know, Speyer. We have some cons ESO consoles of an old mission uh, there in Speyer now. So, I would assume so, but we haven't started discussing that. I yeah, I, I thought you... <laughs> well, I would hate to can cannibalize it, that's what we say. I would hate to bring pieces, I don't know, take one piece home and so on. I would like to find a place where it's uh, entire and you can show it. It's very nice. If you see it, we have put on it also stuff which is not needed, like the, the, um, the antenna, the onboard antenna, which we don't need on ground. We had a flight spare, we have mounted on it. The, the MLI, the multi-layer insulator, which is this black, uh, black coat, yeah? You have spares until launch. After launch, what do you do? You throw them away, we mounted them on it so that it looks real, or even if you don't need it. Yeah, unfortunately not. Uh, no, 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 I'm, say again? Okay, sorry, the question is, Exposure time of the photographs and uh, techniques for processing, enhancing, and so on. I, I really, I, I've never taken any of these pictures, and uh, and I'm not processing the thing, so I really have no idea. Um, we have two cameras, or in fact, three cameras. We have two navigation cameras on board. They are operated here. So if you're interested, I can ask uh, uh, the people who operate them here. It's our flight dynamics people. They know everything about this camera. And, and they program the, the pictures and they process the pictures. Um, the, the other camera is the scientific one, the one that does the nice pictures. And uh, this one, I, I, we don't even operate them here. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think I, I know something, but I better not uh, expose my ignorance even further. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. You. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't answer in a congress of, uh, you know, conference. <laughs> No, there's no way. <laughs> now, okay, uh, yes, we've done it all the time, actually. Uh, with, with such a long mission, uh, you're forced. Either there are failures that develop on the hardware, and uh, you work them around with uh, software updates, um, or there's been software that we have uploaded later because it was developed later. Typically, it was for the payload, so the, the scientific instruments they woke up very late and they said, oh my God, I need a new version. So they upload it. So we can do it, we do it, we've done it many times. Of course, you are extremely careful with that. It's not, you said, you said tomorrow I want to, apart from the space in beta, but I want to do something tomorrow, I have to, we don't do that. It takes months, yeah, validation, even to change a little, because it's not only the development, you, want, you develop a new piece of code and you want it to work properly, yeah. But there's another aspect, which once you know that it's going to work properly, then you have to get it on board. And this thing is flying. Yeah? So there is a very complex process that you also have to test and validate to make this change implemented on board in a safe way and make it active there. Yeah? So it's not, it's not it, it, also this is a very old machine. Uh, so um, any change is super, super critical. We tested on this engineering model here first. And uh, it's quite critical, yeah. But we've done it all the time. We keep doing it. Yeah. Okay. Bandwidth is easy. 
uh, it's uh, we have oh sorry how much software is uh, running on the spacecraft and uh, what's the uh, communication bandwidth so uh, we have uh, bit rates uh, with Rosetta on the uplink is fixed no it's not fixed we have, we go maximum 2000 bits per second two kilobits per second maximum minimum is eight kilobits per second and we've used it in some in some cases it goes into a reduce mode and you have to use it. It takes one minute to send one command. Yeah. Um, the, that's the uplink. Be, downlink, it varies with the distance, of course, uh, between uh, typically, I think the minimum we used was a few thousand bits per second, uh, say 15, 20 kilobits per second, up to about 105 kilobits per second. Very little. Yeah. But imagine these distances. Uh, the, the antenna is 2.2 meters, the transmitter is 20 watts, um, and you have to get the signal through 500 million kilometers, more. And uh, yeah. So, how much software runs on board? Uh, not much, yeah. Uh, the, the, memory, the memory where the live software is running is uh, one megabyte, yeah. <laughs> and uh, of course, there is other, two, other pieces of software which are loaded, but these are always very tiny. So, uh, and then, okay, uh, I have to say, this is the main processor. Uh, we have uh, two main processors, each with one, uh, one megabyte. One deals with the attitude control, and one deals with the data handling, yeah, communications, and uh, so it's two megabytes. All right. <laughs> and, uh, and then there are the processors of the individual instruments, but you're on that order, yeah? So, it, so maybe we have, I don't know, 20 active processors on board, I would have to count. Maximum maybe one megabyte each. It's very old technology. Yeah. One question, and then I go. Sorry. Oh, you see? Oh, there. Oh, there, there is. <laughs> He's the one who asked whether I can. Yeah. yeah? Again, how? how? Uh, I, I, I don't think we can. I don't think we can. Of course, there are, um, uh, say, uh, protective uh, measures which I'm not going to expose to you. But they are, by far, by far, uh, uh, say, ancient and not secure uh, compared to compared to anything that you're using today. Uh, so. The best protection is that, uh, um, well, you have to get into one of our big antennae. You cannot do it from your, uh, from your garden. And to get into those big antennae, there is, there is, say, modern protection of networks and things like this. So that's, uh, that's quite advanced. Yeah? Um, if you had an antenna yourself, um, I think it would be relatively easy. To, to get hold of the of the command link. Um, having said that, uh, when the space cab is in visibility, we establish a command link. And once we've locked, you cannot lock on it. So, um, okay, again, it's it's not impossible, but uh, you you have to have a lot of money and build a 35 meter antenna. <laughs> but these space cab. The space cars are not a priori, pro uh, say, heavily protected. We have space cars which are heavily protected, the Galileo navigation satellites. They are really, uh, there are security measures, secure, I mean, we work in a completely different way with that, yeah? It's not our tradition with scientific satellites. We assume that nobody has really an interest in, uh, in, uh, heck, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> We are not protected enough. We count on the distance. Yes. <laughs> you want to say something? Uh, no, no, then I would say thank you. Okay. Very